Welcome to Mosaic Church, and thank you for joining us here online. To prepare for today's message, we encourage you to utilize the Mosaic Cincinnati app. There, you can view the message notes, put in prayer requests, and so much more. Enjoy the message. Let's finish out today, or this series that we've been in this month, Strong Today, uh, by talking about her fourth mark of a believer. And today we're going to talk about generosity. And so grab that that half sheet on your um, chair or open up your app. The notes are there as well. You can fill in blanks in either place. And so follow along with us today. But the whole kind of thrust of this series is when you look at a believer, what should you see? Now, are there more than four things? Absolutely. But we're focusing on on these four things during this series, prayer, forgiveness, perseverance or endurance, which we talked about last week, and then today, generosity. And I really believe that these four things are crucial for rocks, for foundations of a believer's life. Today, generosity, and you might be thinking, oh goodness, it's the money talk, here we go. And, and man, look, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a, the kind of guy that I, we'll just talk. We'll just, we'll just get real. And what Josiah said when it came to you know, talking about giving, it really is less about the money, and it really is more about your heart. And so right off the bat today, if you've been hurt in a church um, where it was all about the money or, or anything like that, or if you just have this stigma that, oh, churches, all they want is my money, well, hey, the example that we're using in scripture today uh, didn't even have money involved, okay? Because why? Because it's way more about your heart. And so generosity, this isn't just a money thing. This is a time, talents, and treasure thing. Everything that God has given you, he wants you to be generous with. And there's no simpler reason or definition of generosity that I see in scripture than the one we find in Matthew 10, 8. Matthew 10, 8, um, in this passage, Jesus is sending out his 12 disciples to basically go and be representatives of him. He said something really cool. He said, hey, I I give you authority. Man, how cool is that? The son of God, uh, the creator of the universe, the, the one who has existed since before time even began, and he's telling these 12 knotheads, these goofballs that were following him around, hey, I'm gonna give you authority to do what I do. If I was one of those guys, I would be like, are you serious? Do you really know me? Oh, wait, he does know me. We've been walking around together for a while. What is he thinking? But that's what he did. And as he's giving them these marching orders, these instructions about how they were supposed to minister and, 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 and the why behind the what, he says something really cool. He says, give as freely as you've received. Give as freely as you've received. And the first time I read that, I remember it just marked me. And it's like, nothing that I have in my hands should I not be generous with because Jesus has been so generous to me. And this is just the heart of God. And you see when you read this whole passage, and I encourage you to go home and read it this week, read Matthew chapter 10, because Jesus is saying, all these things that I've I've done for you and that you've seen me do, man, go and be generous in the same way that I've given to you. Everything you've been blessed by, give it away. And then right after this verse, Jesus said something really different. He said, oh, and don't take any money with you. Don't take any money with you. So he's sending these guys out without a change of clothes, just one stick, just no money, and they're supposed to be generous. Generous. Jesus said all kinds of revolutionary things about money. Kind of turned the world upside down and he said, pay your taxes. You know, tax season is coming, February 1st. It's, it's in just a couple days and all of our, our tax professionals are gonna be uh, no sleep for the next few months, right? Jesus said, help the poor and needy. He said, give quietly and privately. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He said, be a good steward. He said, don't depend on money. He said, depend on God. He said to invest in eternity. He was very clear not to use money to control or manipulate people. He said to the Pharisees, he said, you should tithe, but don't neglect the more important things as well. And then, you know, one that we're really gonna hone in on today, he said, you can't serve God and money. 
You can't do it. You're going to serve one or the other. And so Jesus said all kinds of things about money. But I think the overall thing about money is that on one hand, we should steward it well. But at the end of the day, it's not the main thing. Although we treat it like the main thing so much of the time. So it's not the main thing unless we make it the main thing. Unless we let it steer the ship. And we have the unique ability to completely miss the point on a lot of things in life. I know that I do. And so if you're with me, just say amen. I I, I miss the point sometimes. We see this in the church of Laodicea in Revelation 3.17. It said, you know, Jesus said to that church, you said, you say I'm rich. I have everything I want. I don't need a thing. And you don't realize that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So the real thrust today is that, man, when it comes to generosity, being generous with what we have, We want to have God's view. We want to have God's eyes. We want to have God's heart, right? God gave us time and talent and treasure to steward for his glory. And it's really possible to miss the point in all of it. This struggle goes all the way back to the beginning. And so turning your Bibles with me today to Genesis chapter 4. We're going to read a long passage from verses 1 through 15. And like I said... The example of generosity that we're gonna to use today, doesn't, money wasn't even invented at the time. It wasn't even invented. But money comes to the front, front of our minds today because that's, most of us, that's our, our weekly, our biweekly harvest. But we're gonna see a different kind of harvest in this passage. Genesis 4, 1 through 15, let's read this story together. It's on the screens. Now Adam had sexual relations with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. When she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. I thought about sharing this, and I'll just, I'll just be really vulnerable for a second. You guys can get a kick out of this. Every time I read that verse, for some reason, I see Tom Hanks around the fire in Castaway saying, oh, I made fire. And so I think of, I think of Eve saying, I, you know, I produced a mid, and you know, having this kind of cheer party. I, for some reason, in my kind of weird mind, that's just, that's the, <clears throat> strike that from the record, and let's move forward. So, with the Lord's help, she produced a man. Later, she gave birth to his brother and named him Abel. When they grew up, Abel became a shepherd, while Cain cultivated the ground. And when it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift, the best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. The Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. This made Cain very angry, and he looked de- dejected. Why are, you, why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain. Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right, but if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. One day, Cain suggested to his brother, Let's go out into the fields. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Afterward, the Lord asked Cain, where is your brother? Where is Abel? I don't know, Cain responded. Am I my brother's guardian? But the Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are cursed and banished from the ground, which has swallowed your brother's blood. No longer will the ground yield good crops for you, no matter how hard you work. From now on, you will be a homeless wanderer on the earth. Cain replied to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. You have banished me from the land and from your presence. You have made me a homeless wanderer. Anyone who finds me will kill me. The Lord replied, no, for I will give a sevenfold punishment to anyone who kills you. 
Then the Lord put a mark on Cain to warn anyone who might try to kill him. So Cain left the Lord's presence and settled in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Sometimes when you read a story like this from the Old Testament, you're like, whoa, will God do that to me? You know, first of all, um, hopefully you haven't killed your brother. Second of all, you know, we see God do this to one person in scripture. You know, we see God mark him and whatever that looked like, we don't know exactly. And, and we see these, these pretty like intense consequences. And, and we definitely know that in the Old Testament, there were different consequences for sin than we see in the New Testament, right? We see, we see a difference. And so when we look at an Old Testament story like this, we need to read it in context, But at the same time, there are timeless principles in God's word from beginning to end that we can apply to our life. And so we're gonna look at a few timeless principles about generosity that we can apply to our lives even from a story like this. So number one, the first thing we see in this story is that the Lord owns it all. The the Lord owns it all, everything we have. It says, when she gave birth to Cain, she said, with the Lord's help, I have produced a man. With the Lord's help. I love that. Because here's Eve, she had walked with God in the, in the, in the cool of the afternoon in the garden, and, and she, had, she had had these conversations with God. She knew the Lord. And because she knew the Lord and because she, she, had, she had seen the glory of God's creation, she knew that everything that she had was given to her by him. What a foundational principle in our life, right? First, First Chronicles 29, 11 through 12 says, Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on the earth is yours. Everything. If you need just some... some emphasis, underline everything. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion, people are made great and given strength. Man, what an eloquent and just amazing description of where we stand in life. That we're here and God is over everything. Everything belongs to him. Everything came from him. Everything goes back to him. And anything that we have in this moment, we're given as a gift to steward and to honor him with it. And this is a perspective creating passage, right? And we see this example lived out in Eve's life. That even with her first child, she realized that it's a gift from the Lord. Man, one of the the favorite things I get to do is to to stand up here with families who have just had kids and, and, and help dedicate these kids to the Lord. And one of those verses that we read is that these these children, children are a gift from the Lord. A precious gift, precious gift. And if, if you've ever known a new mom, especially a first time mom, <laughs> you know, it, you maybe have experienced that you go up and you say, hey, can I hold your baby? And, and, and sometimes moms will be like, no. <laughs> they haven't had their shots yet. Or no, I just don't wanna give them away. Or, or no, you have germs, right? Which is completely natural. They want to protect, they want to, they want to comfort, they want to, they want to shield that baby, right? And sometimes with the best of intentions, we get the equation wrong. And, and, and we think that things that, that really in the end matter to God or are, are owned by God that we own, right? We do, even with the best of intentions. But listen, we cannot take the lordship of Christ out of our relationship with Christ. Notice the words, with the Lord's help. And we understand the nature of our relationship with Christ based on what God's word says. And so when she says Lord or Yahweh, 
It means just that, that he's the ruler of all things. And, and then in Chronicles, it, it unpacks, yours, O Lord, that he really is Lord. And it unpacks what that means, that he's over everything in our life. And so when you serve a Lord, when you say Jesus Christ is, is not only my Savior, but he's my Lord, it means that he owns everything. This word Lord is used a lot in scripture. In fact, in the Old Testament, the word Lord is used 6,500 times all over the place. In the New Testament, Jesus is called Lord 747 times. So we see the Lord of all creation, God the Father, you know, being proclaimed all over the Old Testament, and then Jesus comes on as the Son of God, and he's, he's Lord. Jesus is not just our get out of jail free card. It's not just, oh, I prayed the prayer, I got dunked in the jacuzzi for Jesus, and I'm good. It's more than that. He's Lord. We're proclaiming his lordship in our life, and we're saying, Jesus, you're the executor, you're the power of attorney, you're the CEO, you're the director, you're the president, you're the king, you know, whatever, whatever top title that you want to give the Lord in your life, he's it. He's the name above every name. He's the king of all kings. He's the Lord of all lords, and he owns it all. And it's only because of him that we have anything. And so this is where generosity begins, by understanding that nothing we have do we have without the Lord. The second thing that we see in this passage is that giving something doesn't make you generous. Giving your best is the mark of generosity. Giving something doesn't make you generous. And all of you that got something really weird from grandma this past Christmas that you didn't really want, you know what I mean, right? Getting something, giving something, it's like it doesn't necessarily make it a symbol of generosity. Giving your best is the mark. When it was time for the harvest, Cain presented some. Now, I'm, I'm inserting the inflection here, but Cain presented some of his crops as a gift to the Lord. Abel also brought a gift. And then the scripture is very clear to clarify what kind of gift Abel brought. The best portions of the firstborn lambs from his flock. This principle and this concept of giving God our best and giving God our first is carried out throughout Scripture from beginning to end. From beginning to end. And so you can, you can argue about different things when it comes to, to, to money in the Bible, but the thing that you cannot argue about because we see it immediately after creation and we see it all the way at the end is that we gotta give God our best and we gotta give God our first, right? Cain gave some. Man, I am so guilty of sometimes just giving God something. A lot of times because I felt like I had to. <laughs> out of guilt, out of shame, out of, oh, everybody's doing it, right? So I might as well give something. I've been there. Abel gave the best. Here's another way to say it. Abel gave what he would have wanted for himself. Some of you, might, this might gross you out a little bit, but man, I love watching the, the shows where they are like out in the bush and they're killing their own meat and, and they, they're processing it themselves. And, and I've done that before. I've, I've, I've taken a deer and I've, I've, I've processed it from the beginning to end all by myself. And, and there are cuts of that meat that no one else is gonna touch, right? Man, those back straps, come on, I'll fight you, right? Don't touch them. Uh, get in my belly, right? And so, you know, having been through that in real life, and some of you can't relate, but it's like, man, no. You know, that's, that's for me. That's why when you go, to the, go down to Meyer and, and you're like, oh, a tenderloin sounds good, and you're like, $30? Why? Because it's the best. It's the best. And that's what Abel did. He says, 
okay, which portion would I want for myself? And he brings that to God. This is reflected in what Jesus said to us. He said, love the Lord God with all of your mind, all of your soul, all of your strength. There's just this lavish generosity implied in how we're supposed to love God. I love this definition of generosity. Generosity is the virtue of being liberal in giving, often as gifts. And so Abel, he wasn't just giving something, he was giving his absolute best. And so what does this mean? It means that you can love or you can give without being generous, but you cannot be generous without giving your best. True generosity in God's eyes is when you give God what you would have wanted for yourself. Jesus doesn't just deserve something. He deserves my best all day, every day. In 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8, it says this. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop, but the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or, or in response to pressure, for God loves a person who gives cheerfully, and God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. You see, it's God's plan from beginning to end for us to be generous and to give him our best. The third thing that we see in this story, and this is my favorite, Part of it is kind of tragic, but part of it gives us a real key to life. Number three, you're not just giving God a gift, you're giving him yourself. How do we see this? Listen to the story and really, really look at what it says. It says, the Lord accepted Abel and his gift, but he did not accept Cain and his gift. I love this example because Cain and Abel weren't giving their gifts to something. They were giving their gifts to someone. And not only that, it's very clear that when God looked at their gift, he wasn't just accepting the gift, he was accepting the person. (laughs) Like, man, when this got in my heart, I'm like, oh my goodness. It's not about the gift, it's about my heart. And the heart is gonna be a reflection of my gift. So much of the time when it comes to generosity, when it comes to being people that, that give, we, we think you know, you know, that we're giving to something, like we're giving to an organization, or we're going to giving to a church, or we're giving to a charity, or we're giving to this or to that. But we're not. We're giving to a person. We're giving to God himself. And that changes the picture substantially. Listen to what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 45. He said, I tell you the truth, when you refuse to help the least of these, my brothers and sisters, you are refusing to help me. So on the receiving end, we're giving to a person. And on the giving end, we're not just giving something, we're giving ourselves. And God looked at these two gifts and it was based on the heart that he accepted or rejected the gift. Cain and Abel weren't just giving a gift, they were giving themselves. You know, a question that I sometimes think about when it comes to this is how in the world do you give a gift to someone that has it all? right? God doesn't need my money. God doesn't need my stuff. God doesn't even need my time. And my talents, however great you think they might be, really don't mean anything to God. (laughs) You you know, you think about it, God looks at our talents and he's like, I spoke and light came to be. Right? Right? We look at the most talented athletes and the most talented people in the world. You know, I saw last week, uh, I think it was a guy from the Mavericks, scored like 73 points in a game. And we're like, whoa, 
dude's on fire, right? And God's like, seriously? For real? And so how do you give a gift to somebody who has it all? And maybe some of you struggled with this this last Christmas time and you're like, uh, you know, my parents have everything they need. Like they don't, they don't want for anything. And so what do you do in that case? You don't just not give them anything, although maybe some of you did. You're like, ah, they don't need anything. And so you just kind of left it. But, and sometimes that's our attitude. Oh, they don't need it. I need it more than they do, right? That's probably not the best attitude though. No, you remember that it's not about the gift. It's about my love for them. And so when I give a gift, I want to think not so much about what it is, but the love that accompanies the gift. How about thinking about it like this? The gift only matters in so much as the love that accompanies it. And I think this is what happened with Cain and Abel. Cain just brought something. You know, it doesn't go into a ton of detail, but it could have been his leftovers. It could have been something that he didn't really value as that important. It could have just been whatever he had lying around. He brought some crops. He, he brought some stuff, right? Abel, on the other hand, he said, I'm going to bring it with love, with honor. Does God need the best of what I have? No. But this is the only way that I know to show God how much I love him, Right? So the gift only matters in so much as the love that accompanies it. It's not about the size of the gift. It's about bringing your best. And we see this in the New Testament when Jesus tells the story of the widow who gave half a mite. She gave more than everybody else because she gave all that she had. You can give without loving, but you cannot love without giving. Proverbs 3, 9 through 10 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the best part of everything you produce. Then he will fill your barns with grain and your vats will overflow with good wine. The best part, the first part. I love that. Number four, and we'll close with this for today. We realize in this story that generosity is a key weapon in our battle against sin. And this is one that, at least in my lifetime, I feel like has not um, been taught much like this. But listen to what it says in the story. So just some context, when God accepted Abel's gift, but he did not accept Cain's gift, look what happened. This made Cain very angry, and he looked dejected. Why are you so angry, the Lord asked Cain? Why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. But you must subdue it and be its master. Wow. What does this tell us? That giving... Putting God first in our, in our stuff, having a heart of generosity and giving God our best, it's not just a nice thing to do. It actually puts our heart in alignment with God's. It puts us under God's umbrella. It puts us under God's blessing for our life. And, it, and it's, it's just the right thing to do. And it, it, it protects our heart from greed. It protects our heart from just this attitude that it's ours, that we own anything. It puts God in charge. Listen, Cain not giving his best to God, it didn't hurt God. It hurt Cain. The as as we read the rest of the story earlier, it was a it was a first choice that trickled into a a line of, of bad choices and bad consequences in Cain's life. God makes it really clear that giving him leftovers isn't honoring or right. The other thing that I love about this this example is that when Cain just brings God something and then he's dejected because his gift is rejected, God doesn't just like throw the hammer down on him, does he? No, God has a conversation with Cain. 
And he's like, Cain, why are you dejected? And then he says, God gives him instruction. If you want to do it right, here's how to do it. And so God gives Cain a chance to do the right thing. God tells him that this is bigger than just what you're giving. It's about your heart. It's about not letting a, a root of greed take, take hold in your life. God tells him and warns him, sin is crouching at the door eager to control you, but you must subdue it and be its master. Man, it got real really quick. And so I love that God gives Cain a chance. He gives you a chance. He gives me a chance. And the nice thing is that now on this side of history and on this side of the cross, God gives us lots of chances. God's the God of second chances and third chances and fourth chances. And, and, and his arms, just like the prodigal son, his arms are always open for you. And God is patient, not wanting you know, any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so God gives Cain this choice. He showed him the way out. He gave him direction, and it was Cain who let the sin slide. He let his greed get the best of him, and instead of treating God as his Lord, he ignored the advice, and he did his own thing. And in Cain's life, we see the compound effect of a seemingly small decision that derailed the course of his life. You know, we usually don't see you know, this, like not giving God my best, as a life-altering, life-derailing decision. And I am not saying that if you don't give God your best, then you're gonna go out and commit murder. We're not, <laughs> so don't, don't hear what I'm not saying today. But there is a spiritual connection that when I don't give God my best and when I don't see him as Lord and when I don't put my life under his authority, things don't go very well in my life. They don't. Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said, you can't serve God in money. Only one of them can be your master, he said. And so when we put God first in our generosity, it triggers a ripple effect in the rest of our lives. And let me tell you what, it's way easier to say yes to Jesus in every area when I've said yes to him in an area that really is connected to my heart which is my finances. It's a big win that leads to so many smaller wins in other areas. So what do we see in conclusion? The practice of generosity softens and conditions the heart for God's purposes. But the resistance of generosity hardens and numbs the heart to God's purposes. This is the point that we need to understand from scripture today. It's about my heart. Now, if you've come to Mosaic for a while, you know that I don't talk about money very much. I don't, I don't uh, you know, we're not a church that always talks about that. We don't harp on it, nothing like that. But you cannot separate a heart of generosity from the life of a believer, which is why we're talking about it today. And so I hope you hear my heart. I hope that this is your first time with us today that um, you won't think, oh, here's another pastor talking about money. It's not what it's about. It's not what it's about. It's about us being generous people in every area of our life, in every area of our life. And we can't ignore throughout scripture all the different uh, ways that God taught us and challenged us to be generous and to make sure that money is not our Lord but God is. Let me close today by just reciting to you the most famous verse of all time. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. We are here today. We are a church. We are a people that are following Jesus Christ because God gave his one and only son. Amen? It's the greatest act of generosity that has ever happened on the face of the planet. In all the universe, God is a giver, and he wants you and I to be like him. And so the first step 
and following God and putting him in first place in our life is to really make him our Lord, to make him our, our Lord. And so if you could bow your heads and close your eyes today, maybe it was through a song that we sang today. Maybe it was through this, um, you know, this message. Maybe it was through the prayer time. You just realize that you need Jesus. You need a savior. And it's only because of the generosity of God that you're able to have a second chance that your sins can be forgiven, they can be wiped clean, and you can have a new purpose with a new future. And so I just wanna encourage you today, if you'd like to give your heart and your life to Christ, because God gave so freely to you, you wanna freely give your life back to him. If you wanna surrender all today and make him your savior and your Lord, and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ, if that's you today, I just wanna encourage you to raise your hand. I wanna pray with you. I wanna lead you today in a prayer asking Jesus to be the Lord of your life. Is that you? I'll give you another moment. If you're online watching with us today, you can raise your hand and right there on your couch. Why? Because God sees you. You don't have to be in the room. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. If you raised your hand today, and I wanna encourage you to pray a prayer just like this in your own heart. Say, Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a savior. I realize I'm broken and I need you in my life. God, if I could have fixed myself, I would have a long time ago. And so now I, I surrender my life to you. I give you my heart. I believe that you died on the cross and that you rose again on the third day. And Jesus, I ask you, take away my sins. Forgive me. I need you. God, help me from this day forward to live for you, to put you first in my life, to understand the Bible, your word, and to live by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We believe that if you meant that prayer in your heart today and you invited Christ into your life, the old is gone, the new has come, and you're forgiven, you're changed your new creation, amen? Can we just give those that gave their hearts and lives to Christ a hand today? <clears throat> amen. Before you leave, just a couple more things. If you gave your life to Christ, we've got a bag for you at the Welcome Center with a, a, a Bible and some resources in it. Um, and then for the rest of us, I don't know about you, but when I studied through this passage this way, God really challenged me. God really challenged me to Joe, don't rest on your laurels, don't rest on what you've always done, but to reevaluate my heart of generosity. Am I growing? Am I stagnant? Am I just in a holding pattern? Where am I at? And so if you could stand to your feet with me today, and as a, as a, uh, as a close today, can we just ask God to continue to help us grow as people who are generous like God is to us, amen? Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for today. I thank you for your people. God, I pray that your, that your word can just get deep down in our heart and challenges us, challenge us to the depths of our being. God, I pray that we'd be, we would be people that, that when we come to you and we lay our lives at your feet, when we lay our time and our talents and our treasures at your feet, God, I pray that we bring you our best, the best of our time, the best of our energy, the best of our resources, the best of our talents. God, that we, that we view everything that we do as worship to you and as belonging to you. Help us, Lord, to put you first. God, to see you as Lord. God, to, to really give you everything that we are because you deserve it because you loved us so much that you gave your one and only son, because you sent us out with authority and with power to preach your message and to, to lead people towards you, and you told us freely you've, you've received, freely give. And so in every area of our life, God, I pray that you help us to grow in generosity, knowing that when we serve others, knowing that when we invest in kingdom causes around the world, that really we're giving unto you. Help us in Jesus' name. Help us, Lord. Amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining us for today's message. We look forward to having you back next week.